So our next uh, speaker is, and I guess the last for the day, is uh, Professor Zico Colter from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So Zico, it's all yours. Oops, there we go. Now I'm unmuted. Okay, well, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I will, tr the, 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 the chat has been very active during the sessions, which is great. Um, but it might make it a little bit hard to follow while I'm, while I'm talking. So uh, I'll try to pause briefly, but I guess we have the panel coming up too, and we'll try to maybe defer some of the questions, or I'll try to defer answering some of these questions to the panel. So my talk today is about incorporating constraints into deep learning. Um, and there's some application to grid optimization, <laughs> as is the nature of, the, or as is the topic of this uh, workshop. But actually, this is from a, from a sort of methodological standpoint, this is much more about the uh, fundamental capabilities in neural networks to begin with, and, um, and less about the applications. Uh, since this is more about kind of the, you know, how we do these things from a, from a broad perspective in, from a machine learning standpoint. Um, I also, I also, it's sort of great to see here. So, so usually these talks, this talk is very, um, I have to introduce a lot of context before I give this talk because um, no one would understand possibly why you'd want to incorporate things like constraints into uh, neural networks and things like this. Uh, but, but already all the previous talks have, have introduced this topic. And so I have much less to introduce here. Uh, and in fact, actually, there, there, there's a huge amount of overlap between what I'm going to talk about here and the previous talks you saw, especially um, Bowser's talk. Um, they're really just, it's essentially looking at the exact same problem, just used in a, in a slightly different way. Um, and so I'll try to kind of uh, highlight those comparisons also when I get to it. Um, the last thing I'll say is also sort of looking at sort of seeing the, the workshop so far. I suspect that the questions people are going to have are exactly the orthogonal questions that I'm trying to, <laughs> that I spend most of the time trying to address in these slides. Uh, so in terms of the applicability to power systems in particular, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have much less on that and much more, again, on the methodological side of things. So maybe either in the panel or I'll try to even stop as needed during the talk and, and, and try to address you know, why this is a reasonable thing to do and why you'd want to do this from the first point, why you'd want to use, sort of use these techniques to begin with, uh, these, these, these machine learning techniques to begin with. OK, so with that all as, as precursor, uh, let me get started. Uh, first, I should say that this is really, uh, th this, this work is, is joint work with several of my students and other collaborators. In particular, I want to um, uh, highlight Priya Donti and Mel Roderick, who are my, uh, two of my students that have done um, the vast majority of this work, um, as well as Bing, um, Bing King uh, Chen, uh, a student of Mario Berges, that did a lot of the work um, you'll see sort of highlighted in the second half of the empirical results here. All right, so let's let's jump right in to the to the talk. Uh, oops. All right, there we go. Um, so I'm going to start with a kind of uh, background on robust control, um, a little discussion on um, on uh, how do we incorporate robust control deep reinforcement learning. I'll talk about how we how we do this sort of sort of mathematically, and then I'll talk about some initial kind of experimental results. But before I run again, I want to talk a little bit about sort of from a high level. Um, what deep reinforcement learning is. And maybe this will get a little bit, at least, <laughs> I don't know if I'll succeed at it, at convincing, uh, convincing Maria, but, but um, give a little bit of context about why I think deep reinforcement learning is such an interesting area to begin with. So um, deep reinforcement learning, or reinforcement learning as, as a whole, and, and then um, kind of augmented with modern machine learning techniques, has really, sort of, no matter how you look at it, achieved some amazing things in recent years. Uh, so um, you know, now, six years ago, there was this sort of famous paper on playing Atari games with um, with deep reinforcement learning. So they would look at you know the, the the pixel of an Atari game and and, and then figure out how to move the joystick from this and you with know, you know, one algorithm kind of solve all these Atari games and essentially have superhuman performance in most of them. Um, of course, maybe the most famous uh, accomplishment of deep uh, deep RL was the AlphaGo um, success. So. A team at DeepMind, actually these are both done by DeepMind here, but um, a team at DeepMind built this, this AlphaGo system that um, you know, beat the world champion in Go at least, I, I would say, 10 years before we were sort of thinking this would happen kind of by natural progression. The incorporation of, of, of uh, machine learning and deep learning in particular really highly accelerated this process. Um, and and there, there's been a continued sort of stream of successes since then. So, for example, um, a couple of years ago, OpenAI 
built a system that was uh, at the time not quite world class, but now world class with um, the best for, for this, playing this um, this game Dota. Two. It's a, like a strategy game called Dota Two, um, and this is a hard game because you know there's there's uh, Go Go is actually a, probably a, a, the biggest success you've seen, but at the same time it's also a fully observable state. You can see the whole board. You know, it might not seem that challenging. Um, there there's sort of limited time horizons stuff like that, but things like these sort of strategy games, they're they, you know very limited information. They very long time horizon. Uh, the state is hidden. There are all these things that make these problems very challenging. And yet deep reinforcement learning has been able to solve these things kind of amazingly well. Uh, and so this sort of brings to mind the question, I mean, this is the question that to be clear, there's of course lots of work going on in it, uh, but why aren't we here with, uh, with power grid control at this point, right? It seems at least intuitively that, you know, I, 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 I don't want to at all minimize the challenge of, of, of power control at least, but it seems like it's on the level of other problems, right? It's sort of similar to other problems. You have distributed uh, control problems where you have some hidden information, some hidden state, you have to react very quickly. That seems actually a lot of in, similar, in, in many ways sort of similar in character to some of these other control tasks um, and maybe sort of could, um, game playing problems people have dealt with in reinforcement learning, yet you don't see fielded uh, examples of, of, um, of deep reinforcement learning actually controlling real systems. And so, so why not? And I would sort of say that the obvious answer is that um, deep RL sort of focuses on a very different setting than classical control or what would also sort of broadly call robust control here, because I'm, I'm going to focus on that setting. And essentially, you know, deep RL is all about performance and expectation. Uh, typically, though, in simulated systems, ones where you can explore the domain very actively without, um, without sort of suffering bad consequences, right? So to play uh, that game of, of uh, Dota, the this, 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 this strategy game, they had to play you know, many, I think, hundreds of years of effective gameplay against itself in a simulated environment so it would learn what to do, basically. Um, and that's something you can't afford to do on a grid. And if you do it in a simulated environment, it probably won't translate to the real grid because this, of course, there are differences that we don't really don't really fully understand. Or we even if we understand them, we typically can't model them all that well. Maybe we'll say. Um, so, but but deep and deep reinforcement learning is also about sort of very expressive policies. So very very rich uh, classes of possible controllers. That can express very very complex control laws to get the best performance possible and expectation. But uh, on the on, on the flip side, and this is where we sort of bring in robust control here, typically don't come with things like stability or guarantees about their performance, right? And so this is sort of the classical kind of dichotomy between robust control and and deep RL. And on the other hand, you know, robust, robust control really is all about stability. It's all about guarantees we can make under certain uh, bounded uncertainty assumptions. Uh, but it's also about much simpler policies, typically, right? So, so there are some very simple classes of policies, say linear policies, though some simple nonlinear policies also have been analyzed. Uh, and the question is sort of what can we do in in this very you know restricted setting, but can we provide much stronger guarantees? And this talk, as is I think the past several talks now, uh, so usually this is this is more unique, but I think the, you know I'm, I'm I'm following a trend here. Um, this talk is about trying to sort of bridge these two worlds at least a little bit. In a in a similar, but I, I would say a little bit more. I would you know I'm, I'm going to talk in a little bit more generic fashion than than I think the the, the previous talks, um, and really talk about how we can kind of capture some aspects of robust control generically in the context of deep RL systems. So that's going to be my agenda. Um, and now with that as kind of the precursor, let me give a little bit of background on the kind of robust control domains that I'm talking about here and the sort of problems I actually want to solve. All right, so um, the, the form of robust control that I'm going to be concerned with um, are looking at controllers that are certified that, that, that are, I would say, certifiably robust to worst case disturbances within some bounded class. And a classical example here is things like norm bounded linear dynamical inclusions. Uh, the term linear here is a bit misleading. This could be nonlinear systems, to be clear. But the point is, we're thinking about dynamical systems where we can bound the nonlinearity or the allowable disturbances within some set uh, that's described by a linear system. Now, of course, this is not all systems you can do this for, but there's actually a pretty wide class of nonlinear systems for which you can do this. 
Right. And the basic idea here is that your, your current state, so this could be you know, your, your, um, your power system state, um, the, the frequency and everything else, frequency and voltage, but it could also be, this, this really is a very generic thing. So we also have examples on you know, cart pole domains and stuff like this too. Um, the, the basic setting here that we're talking about is that the time derivative of the state, which I'll we'll call it xt, is, is included, it has to be contained in this uh, other vector here, which is some linear function of the, the current state, um, another linear function of the control, and then some bounded disturbance here. And this is the key part here. This disturbance is the key part here that we're gonna, that we're really gonna talk about. It sort of bounds how big um, sort of the either unknown components or the nonlinear components of the system can be. Right? And to be clear, these are all very, very standard techniques from robust control. This goes back many, many decades now. These are, these are well-established things. I'm just sort of giving a background on the setting where that we really care about here. Um, and the case that we're going to talk about in particular are these norm bounded LDIs. And what that means is that the magnitude of the disturbance is bounded by some other linear function of the state and the, and the control. So essentially, based upon how much control effort I apply, I know that my disturbance is going to be, and, and how far my state is from the equilibrium point, I know that my, um, my uh, deviation essentially from the linear system is going to be bounded. Okay. And that's this, I'm going to consider sort of very, very standard setting. Of course, this has been applied to many power domains, like inverter control, stuff like this, but I'm considering it kind of in a fully generic sense here. Right? So that's the setting I'm going to consider. And in this setting, um, there's some very strong things we can say about finding policy classes that are guaranteed to be stable. So here's an example of kind of a traditional robust control synthesis technique. Um, to be clear, there's, there's hundreds of these things, um, and there's many, many different LMI methods that you know, do all sorts of different variants on this. But the basic idea of all of them is that, uh, or a, a large class of them, is that given a specification of the system like this, right? So given, given you know, the, our, our A, B, C, major Cs, et cetera, the goal of a lot of robust control is to find a linear control law. So a control UT, which is a, a linear function of the state that results in the system being stable under any disturbance that satisfies this bound. So in other words, under any possible disturbance that satisfies this bound, we wanna find a linear control law that stabilizes the system. And you know, the statements that robust control makes are things like this, right? Uh, we can do this by finding you know, positive definite matrices that solve the following linear matrix inequality. Um, you know, a bunch of a bunch of things here have to be some negative definite matrix, and then we form our control our our, uh, our control law based upon this. So you know, uh, obviously, right? <laughs> very very intuitive, I'm sure. Um, I, I'm saying I'm putting this here somewhat as a as just a a, a, a little bit facetiously here. Uh, there, there's no need to actually understand what these what these terms all mean. I'm just what I'm trying to do is get across the form of the actual problems that are solved in robust control synthesis. You basically have some system specification, you solve some linear matrix inequality, and this gives you a control specification or a control law that satisfies some specification. Um, now, the way this actually, what, what, what's really going on here, to be clear, so this is the, these, these are the details, this is how you actually solve it, but what's really ha happening here is that these systems, this is exactly what, what um, the earlier talk was mentioning, what, what, what these methods are doing is they're constructing a Lyapunov function for this state. So they are constructing a Lyapunov function that is a, um, a positive definite function, which is decreasing along trajectories of the system. Um, so V is a Lyapunov function. In fact, by the previous LMI, which I'll just go to in a second here for one more time, what this positive definite matrix actually is, this is actually a, the, the quadratic form for this this Lyapunov function. It's actually, it's actually inverse. The quadratic form doesn't really matter. Um, basically, our Lyapunov function is of this form here. And when you solve that LMI, it basically is a, it, it, it comes out of um, exactly kind of the boundedness conditions and you know the decrease conditions that, that, that you want to satisfy. Um, but basically, what it, what it means is when you solve that LMI, um, that, that, that linear matrix inequality, uh, you get a, the output of it is a, both a linear control law, but also a Lyapunov condition, uh, a Lyapunov function that such that the linear control you get satisfies this um, Lyapunov decrease condition for the um, for this for any term in the system, okay. and that's basically how these methods work, uh, broadly speaking, right? So the question is, you know, 
what what do you do about this? <laughs> um, what, what 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 really like? How can you improve upon this? It seems like this is sort of this this sort of very naturally falls out. You very naturally have a linear control law. You have a quadratically up and up function. What more can you really do here? And I, I do want to make before I go on to sort of what we what, what we can do here. I want to make one sort of important note here. And the important note is that um, I wrote our system in this way as this linear dynamical inclusion here um, with known A, B, and G, but that the true underlying system is actually could be unknown and nonlinear, right? So our, for example, our disturbance could represent some nonlinearities, could model, it could represent unmodeled dynamics, et, et cetera. And so even though we are um, you know, talking about nonlinear systems, we're still, uh, we're still, you know, even though I write my system as a nonlinear system here, um, we're still talking about sort of a, sorry, as a, if I, even though I write it as a linear system here, or some little specific linear system here, it's still underlying it is a, a nonlinear system. Um, but the problem, of course, is that despite, and this is the, the exact same point that, 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 that Basel was making earlier, is despite the fact that this is a nonlinear system, um, most robust control still focuses on linear control loss. And it basically proves stability under under on any of these disturbances of a simple kind of linear control law, right? And so, you know, this seems suboptimal. In fact, it is suboptimal, right? We, we know for a fact that these, that these linear control laws are often suboptimal. Um, yes, there are many situations where you can design explicitly a linear or a nonlinear control law that works better, but finding the optimal nonlinear control law is very, very hard. Um, and we have these techniques, these, these you know, deep reinforcement learning techniques that, are, that have proven the ability to do a very good job at finding highly nonlinear optimal control law, or not, not I mean, not optimal, but highly, <laughs> very well, very good performing nonlinear control laws um, in very, very challenging scenarios. And so it'd be nice if we could use these things in the context of solving problems like this. I suspect that's going to be the point of some contention uh, in, in the panel and others, uh, other places, or it has been at least. But but I'm sort of taking that as a given that you know deep RL can do these things quite well if it can meet the, the conditions it needs to meet. Okay, so the next bit that I want to talk about is how we kind of merge these two things together. How can we in fact incorporate robust control techniques into deep reinforcement learning? And the idea here is actually quite quite simple. Um, it's really a pretty, you know, the, the first approximation is a pretty simple combination of the notions of robust control and the notions of deep reinforcement learning, but I want to describe it kind of, kind of slowly and take it kind of bit by bit. So here's the, here's the, the setting that we're, we're going to talk about. Um, now, this is going to differ from the standard deep reinforcement learning paradigm, because in most reinforcement learning, it's the assumption, the assumption is that the agent acting in an environment actually does not have a model of the system. The system is sort of unknown. Uh, all it can do is take exploratory actions to kind of figure out what's, what's going on. And if the system is really unknown, if you just are, you know, turn the, the, the keys of the power grid over to a deep RL agent, it really knows nothing about the underlying system. And so there's no way, practically speaking, for it to actually guarantee safety or stability of the system. Right? It's just not going to be possible. Um, and so this is why, by the way, deep RL typically has to take unsafe actions. There's, there's no way around making unsafe, taking you know, potentially catastrophic ac uh, actions if you don't know anything about the actual uh, yeah, you know, about, about the system you're trying to control. You just you have to you know fall off the cliff a few times before you realize the cliff there, and then stop doing that. So this is not going to be practical for real systems. And so instead, we're actually going to consider a we're going to consider a different setting, which is actually the exact setting that we have in traditional robust control. So we're going to assume that the true system might be unknown, but what we do still know is we still know bounds or an uncertainty set that captures the system as specified by the normal robust control setting. That's going to be kind of our, our, our paradigm here, is actually not going to be traditional RL pair. We're, we're, we're going to be using techniques from deep, deep, from, from deep reinforcement learning, but we're going to be considering kind of the, 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 the knowledge setting that we have in traditional robust control. And then the challenge is going to be, can we use RL methods to learn a better policy than the robust linear policy? 
while maintaining the same guarantees as robust control. And really we want to maintain these not just in operation time, but also during learning, because we're going to potentially be in situations where all we can do is sort of learn online and there isn't much more that we can do than that. Okay, so that's that's going to be the, the key task that we that we um, have here. Um, and it turns out that in this setting, uh, we can do this. So let me describe how we do this in a very generic sense. Um, and then I'll, 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 I'll sort of come to the details of how this actually works in practice. I see there have not been any questions yet. So, so uh, or at least I'm not getting them. So, so feel, please do feel free to ask questions. I can happy to pause and interrupt uh, for a while if there are questions. All right, so how, so, so, so how do we do this? How do we actually use an RL method to learn a better policy than the robust linear one uh, while still maintaining the same guarantees? Because we know for a fact that if we don't maintain some semblance of stability guarantees, we just can't use sort of machine learning or reinforcement learning methods within a safety critical context. So here is the basic idea. The basic idea is we are going to take the output of a deep RL policy and project the policy to be stable under the same robust control Lyapunov function we extracted from normal robust Lyapunov control. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, what it means is this function here, this Lyapunov function that we extracted from our traditional kind of robust control specification, it tells us that this, the, the linear policy we have, we've extracted from robust control specification, that is guaranteed to decrease this function, right? So we have an existence proof that under the robust, you know, our robust control specification, we have an existence proof of a function that actually decreases this Lyapunov function. But it's not the only function that decreases this Lyapunov function either. There actually are a whole number of functions that can decrease this Lyapunov function. And the idea of our technique here is that we're going to use a generic RL kind of policy to try to control our system, but we're going to enforce that that policy actually also obeys this Lyapunov decrease condition. I think it's actually very similar to what you saw in the talk earlier this morning too, but it's just done in a little bit more generic or a little just sort of slightly different fashion, uh, in this case, a bit more generic, but also, you know, less specified and potentially less, less performant than the ones you might see that are specialized to a given domain. All right, so, so how does this work? Well, um, so this is our Lyapunov function. It's guaranteed to be positive definite, of course, everywhere. And so the condition that a policy decreases this under any dis allowable disturbance, um, with a little bit of, of work, you can basically show that, that the, the supremum over all possible disturbances, which is sort of the worst case increase in the Lyapunov function, um, it's just a simple optimization problem, actually. You can kind of bound it as a function of the control and having a, like a two-norm uh, function of the control plus a linear term of the control. And this whole, the, 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 the details here are not important. The important part is the worst case increase of the Lyapunov function is equal to a convex set over, is, 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 is specified um, by a convex function over the, the allowable control actions. Okay, so if I take the worst case increase, that ends up being a convex function of the, of the, of the control input that we have UT. Okay. And so all that we want to ensure is we want to ensure that our whatever output our network produces, it better produce an output that actually decreases, that, that, that ensures that essentially this value of this function here is negative. Because what we really want is we want our Lyapunov function to be decreasing along trajectories of this system. And that's all we need. We just need this function here to be negative. Uh, and this is a very similar thing, again, to what we saw this morning, where you wanted a certain uh, inner product to be positive. That's, that's, that's sort of the same, the same thing, just a, a, in, in, a, in a different setting here. So um, how do we do this? How do we guarantee that a neural network policy uh, actually decreases this Lyapunov function when it's applied to this, when it's applied kind of the worst case uh, input to the system. And in general, th there are some cases where this is possible to do in a very specialized manner. So you can sometimes create a network that, you know, by constraining the weights in a certain way, as you saw this morning, 
you guarantee the network will always um, obey certain conditions that guarantees the crease of the Apennal function. But in general, this is actually kind of hard to do. It's hard to specify constraints on the network weights that always will ensure that a certain policy will decrease the Apennal function. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit more of a generic approach here, and we're going to do the following. We're going to define the deep policy in a very kind of straightforward, but actually kind of complex manner, <laughs> a straightforward seeming, but a little bit detailed manner here that, um, that does the following. So we let our, first of all, we let our neural network policy to start with be kind of any function. So it can be any function f uh, of, the, of the state. We're going to say that our control, our sort of nominal control is, is any function of the, of the input. But of course, this function may not, depending on the structure of the neural network, it's an arbitrary neural network. So it might not actually decrease the Apennal function. And so what we're going to do is just sort of the simplest thing we can do, though. We're going to take the output of the nominal neural network policy and we're just, just going to project it on to the decrease set according to this Lyapunov function. All right, so we're going to take the output of our policy, and we're just going to project it onto the safe set, okay? where we know a couple things. So, so, so essentially, what, what's, what the, the, the picture to have in mind here is the following picture. So this region in blue here, this indicates all those controls that, in some sense, are safe. Right, they're safe because we know those are the controls that decrease the Lyapunov function as given to us by the by the robust control specification. Um, and so, as long so we know that as long as we are in somewhere in that set in our control space, that we will actually decrease uh, this Lyapunov function, and we will effectively guarantee stability of our system even under the worst case perturbations. We also know that this set is not empty. Because we know, again, from robust control, that the linear control law actually lies somewhere in this set. So that, that is one element of the set, because the linear control law is actually what we use to define this the Apennal function. But the set is bigger than that, too. It has a much bigger space than that. And so uh, what we can do is we can take our neural network policy and just project it onto here and treat our final policy, basically, as just the, the, the concatenation of the original nominal policy projected onto our safe set. Now, this is a little bit odd because, OK, that, 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 that seems fine. I can, I can see how that would work like at runtime. But how would you train a system with a question like this? How would you sort of train a system? Um, or how would you train a deep reinforcement learning system that you know, had this concatenation of a, of a policy plus a projection? That's going to be the section of the, of the next section of the talk. That's sort of the details here. Um, I'm going to go that kind of fast because I imagine that's actually less of the questions people here have. But I, I, I do want to highlight it a little bit. And, and that's going to be sort of the, the, the next portion. Um, but just to summarize, I just want to summarize this because there's, there's sort of a lot going on here. I, I kind of want to get back to uh, a high level description of what's really happening here. So at a high level, here's a summary of our approach. As input, we are given a robust control specification for some unknown dynamical system, right? Like, like, like we would want to solve. I mean, like, like, like is done very often for H infinity control and many other settings, right? This is sort of what we what we are given. Um, the first thing we do is we solve the traditional robust control synthesis problem. So whatever, and and, and, I, and I showed sort of the the, the norm bound the LDI one, but there's there's a bunch of others you can have too. We just solve the normal linear robust control problem. And this gives us both a linear control law, but it also gives us a Lyapunov function that guarantees stability of the linear control law. We then use the output of this robust control synthesis to decide to define a safe set that guarantees actions will be stable um, for the a set which guarantees actions are, sta are, are stable um, when we, when we when we take them under this robust under this system specification. And finally, we define our reinforcement learning policy to be an arbitrary deep network. So it's an absolutely arbitrary policy, which probably won't satisfy any stability constraints, followed by a projection onto that safe set. And that's really the key point here is our, our, our final policy is, is the concatenation of the arbitrary neural network plus this projection onto a safe set. 
And the key point is when we do this, the resulting policy will have the same guarantees as the robust control policy, but it can potentially learn to do much better, not necessarily in the worst case, because the worst case, actually, for, for the worst case, actually, the linear policy is in some sense optimal, though we'll, I don't want to actually want to get too much into that, but it can do much better kind of in the average case, because the system is still non-linear. We know the linear bounds around it are usually an over approximation. And so what we know is that, you know, on average, the system can do much better while still guaranteeing good performance kind of in the, in, in the worst case. And that's our, our, our paradigm for how we want to actually do this. All right, let me um, pause here so there are any questions. The, the, uh, the next bit I'm going to kind of go through quickly, and I want to see if there are any general questions about the, about the, the approach here. Zico, it seems like it would be hard to prove that that would be an improvement. Um, it is very hard, yes. So the, 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 the improvement part is entirely empirical. So the improvement we want to see is that under an expectation, right, under this normal evaluation, we hope at least that the policy performs better when we evaluate it, right? This is sort of the normal evaluation you do of, of RL methods, right? Um, we want it to work better kind of in the average cases. This, this, this is the goal of deep reinforcement learning for the most part. Uh, and it really is a goal in a lot of cases, right? You sort of want things to work better on average. That's just a matter of taking samples and evaluating it. But we also want to guarantee that it works OK in the worst case. And that's the, that's the, uh, the, the setting we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, yeah it's very hard to prove that it works better because these are nonlinear systems. And, and neural networks are very generic nonlinear function approximators. It's very hard to show you know, how they will do in the worst case or to prove anything about them. All you can do is evaluate them empirically. Yeah, I mean, there's some intuition that it's getting trained to whatever form the neural net takes, and then the projection could perhaps mess up some of those policies that it has learned. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. That, that, that's actually a really good point. So it's really it's, it's a really good point. So, th so this is actually the key point that, that, that we do address here. So you might say, okay, we're going to you know execute some some we're going to train some neural network, but then when we run it in reality, we're always going to add this projection step. That's actually not what we're doing. What we are going to do is we're going to treat the policy as the combination of the projection and the nominal policy, and we're going to train their concatenation together. So we're going to train the combined nonlinear policy plus projection in an end-to-end -end fashion so that the combination is actually what does well. Okay, that's so, really cool. Yeah. yeah, so we're defining our network as the combination of the nominal network plus the projection. That's yeah. actually the key point, which I clearly had to make uh, more clear there, but that's what we're doing. And that's really the key point to all of this. So Zico, uh, yeah. Maria, so the combination, you know, we have our L1, L2, H infinity norms and so yeah. forth. So when you combine them, which yeah. one are you taking? Oh, so the I, I'm, I'm so so the 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 set that you I mean so 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 based upon specification the L L one L two H infinity whatever right that will define your safe set right so so that will define your your projection set differently depending on which notion of stability, of, of robustness you 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 encode um, then in terms of the control criteria you can use whatever you want so I can use whatever objective I want to have to optimize my 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 total policy however I want to. Um, I just want to make sure that the combined, the combination of these two things is stable under, under the same specification that I have there. Okay, but you can use whatever kind of reward function you want mm -hmm. to train your RL method, yeah. So does this, uh, does the results depend a little bit on how long in the future are you optimizing? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so like with all RL methods, right? There are notions of like a discount factor of a horizon, yeah. all sorts of things. That is, that is endemic to the RL setting also, just like it is in the, in the control yeah. setting, right? Um, but the point is you can do all that kind of, you can evaluate all of that in the expected empirical case because you have this guarantee that your combined system is still safe. So is the result still parametric with respect to time over look, out, look 
forward horizon for RL, right? Uh, um, so, so you typically don't have an explicit uh, look ahead horizon in your policy. What you have in your policy is a very generic kind of function approximator that will just try to do as well as it can. That will just sort of be, try to optimize to 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 optimize some, you know, multi-step horizon loss and things like this. Um, the point is that your, your policy class itself is just a neural network followed by this projection. Maybe more of that we can talk about offline. Because I, I think it's being a little bit, um, Thank a little you. bit specific there. So maybe we'll talk about that in, in the panel or sometime. Okay. So before I, before I, and I, I know I'm running out of time too. So I want to get to uh, two main points. Maybe I'll skip through some of the some of the, the details here. But the key point, and actually the key methodological point here is how you train a network that involves both these two things. How can I have a network that has both a sort of normal neural network F plus a projection step and train this all in an end-to-end -end fashion? Because I definitely do not want to just train F and then follow it with a projection because that, that could destroy the actual content of my, of my policy when I do that projection. So the key point is we're actually going to make this projection effectively be another layer in the network. We're going to write the projection effectively as a last layer that we apply to our network. And we're just going to do it in, in PyTorch or anything else. And we can we, we have you know, the ability to do this. And, and we're going to treat our projection not as something outside the network, but as something that's actually in the network itself. Now, this is actually not that hard to do, but doing it requires that we define the notion of a layer a bit differently in machine learning. So typically a layer in, in deep learning is sort so of kind of as an explicit function mapping inputs to outputs. <coughs> so we typically think of layers in, in deep networks. Um, but there's actually another kind of layer we can introduce here called an implicit layer. And an implicit layer in a deep network is actually based not upon kind of some discrete explicit computation, but it's defined based upon, uh, based upon solving some, essentially some nonlinear equations and outputting the solution to a set of nonlinear equations that depend on the inputs of that layer. So in this case, for example, the input of the layer would be the nominal control law. The output would be an optimization problem where you try to minimize the distance from the, from the output of the layer of, of the projection to that nominal control, subject to the constraint that this has to be a safe action. Right? You can write this projection as an optimization problem, which is going to be the solution to a set of nonlinear equations, i.e. the KKT conditions for the optimization problem, and you can formulate that as an implicit layer. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have too much time to get into this now, so I'm probably going to skip a little bit of the details here. But the basic idea of implicit layers is that in order to integrate um, layers like this into a deep learning framework, you have to be able to differentiate through them. So I have to be able to both solve them, which is sort of just solve my projection, but then to run back prop the network, I also have to back propagate through the layer, basically computing derivatives through my projection operation. And this seems a little bit non-trivial in practice, um, but it turns out that you can do it by basically using a technique called implicit differentiation and the implicit function theorem. Um, you take your optimality condition, you differentiate both sides, you do some tricks, which I won't get into now because we're, I think I have three minutes left of my actual talk time here. Um, you combine kind of what's known with automatic differentiation with, with, with what's not known. And what you get out in the end is actually a pretty simple expression for how to actually compute the derivative that you care about, which is the derivative through this thing. Um, so the bottom line is that uh, you can can compute can treat these solutions and projections just like layers in a normal network, and in fact, you can implement them in PyTorch or anything else. Now, um, I realize that's kind of going through it quickly. So what I'll, I'll just put a little plug in here that if you're interested about this, um, uh, some some um, uh, some colleagues of mine and, and, and I actually give a tutorial on these implicit layers at last NeurIPS. And we have a website, there's both videos as well as some extensive notes you can look to, to look at to, to go through this all with examples. But the, the upshot is that you can basically plug in a projection layer into PyTorch, differentiate through that, and have it just be one bigger network instead of a smaller network. Um, and so you know, this, this is our summary. And the only point I want to make here is that we're, we're defining our policy as the deep network followed by a projection, and we're making it all differentiable using implicit layers. 
All right, so let me just give some quick uh, hint about the kind of results we get now. Finally coming to a few examples in power systems, or one of three <laughs> at least. Um, but again, these are sort of very, to, to, to be clear, these, these, these are very, this is all toy examples. Um, we, we are not claiming that these are sort of fielded things that really work in practice yet. Um, a lot of work remains to be done, of course. Um, so the first setting we're gonna look at is like the, again, it's gonna take me a few minutes to even get here. Maybe I'll, I'll skip one. Oops. Uh, going, computer's getting a little slow. Um, the first thing we're going to use is just uh, uh, going to consider the setting of, of random uh, LDIs, actually. So a setting where we have some non uh, linear system or, or linear looking system, but where um, the the uh, the disturbance term is actually computed as some deterministic nonlinear function of the state scale to ensure that it satisfies the um, the, the, the 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 norm bound constraints on it. Um, in the normal operation, that's just a fixed linear function. So it's a nonlinear system, but it's a very sort of simple one. A nonlinear system basically where this disturbance term is just some function of the state and control. So nonlinear function of the state and control. Uh, but then in an adversarial operation, we actually allow this thing to sort of be maximally perturbed to try to disturb the system. So we're also looking, trying to look at the worst case performance when we satisfy the bound with a with, with sort of a worst case disturbance, even though in normal operation, it's a very well-defined nonlinear disturbance. And we're just doing random things for now. So, you know, take this all with a grain of salt. All right, so here's here's the basic results and I'll, 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 I'll go through this one. Maybe I'll skip the second one a little bit or just highlight the, the, the second and the third a little bit more briefly. But the way these sort of look is, is essentially like this. So we can consider a bunch of um, kind of, you know, traditional control methods as well as, um, these two uh, RL methods. So LQR is traditional, traditional control. Um, MVP and PPO are both a model-based and a, and a policy-based optimization technique based off and from deep reinforcement learning. Um, and the point is that in the on, on this blue bar, which shows the nominal performance of the system, they do quite a bit better than, um, than LQR, right? They, as you would expect, you know, a nonlinear control law can do better on a nonlinear system than LQR with a linearization can. Um, uh, when we look at the robust, and then we also have sort of a robust control method, which is the, the obviously LQR with this with this additional constraint that the the, the Lapinov function has to satisfy this LMI, um, and then we have our sort of our our methods here, which are these projection methods onto the you know, methods that project onto this um, use, use use one of these RL methods, but they then project onto the feasible set. Um, and so the point is that these these ones here are one are, are sort of our nonlinear methods work better in the setting than, than the robust uh, LQR does. Um, but then so that that's good. But then the the real important thing is that unlike you know if, if you just had this, you'd probably pick one of the default RL methods because they're working even better according to our according to the actual LQR cost. By the way, so we're just considering the quadratic cost. They actually work better because they're still a nonlinear system, and so they can control the system better. Um, but the problem, of course, is when you consider worst case disturbances in this setting, all the traditional methods, they go unstable, as you exactly as, as you would expect. Um, whereas our approaches um, all remain stable. They don't do much better than LQR does in the worst case, right? Because in the worst case, actually, that nonlinear system is, is, is pretty good. But on average, in, in sort of the, the, the nominal mode of operation, they do better than, than uh, uh, LQR or robust LQR, while at the same time preserving stability and guaranteeing stability, the same kind of guarantees that um, you would have in traditional robust control. Um, so these ones are unstable and ours are, ours are then stable. Um, okay, I just want to highlight now two uh, additional settings we've been doing. I've been looking at with 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 similar techniques. These are actually slightly different parameterizations of the safe set. It's a little bit different from the standard robust control. It's more kind of just a parameterization of the safe set in terms of a linearized model plus certain safety constraints of of of, of, this, of, of the system that are sometimes over over constrained to guarantee a, a degree of safety. Um, this is actually also from a different paper that sort of formulates things a little bit differently. This is a paper we had. The the, the work I described so far is a paper we had. Um, Oops, last year at, uh, or this year at uh, iClear. This next two are paper are, are examples from uh, work we had at an upcoming e-energy and an upcoming e-energy paper. Um, one on building control, where we basically show, <coughs> I think I'm out of time here, so I'll just try to give the, give the, um, the highlights here. We basically show that by combining um, a, a pro th th this projection operator after our policy and training the whole thing end to end, 
we can guarantee or we, 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 we can guarantee certain criteria are met under our you know control specification that we have under our robustness specification we have at the beginning um and in practice what, what this means is that we're able to actually do things like decrease heating demand for building control while um guaranteeing under our specification guaranteeing that set points are met that we stay within certain temperature bounds um, and in practice, or I mean in simulated practice in an energy plus model, um, showing less discomfort or less discomfort of the method while um, while having uh, substantially less uh, uh, demand in, in terms of the power used for, for, for controlling the system. And it basically does it by, by intelligently preheating things. So compared to a baseline controller, but also compared to uh, sort of learning control, <coughs> we're able to essentially um, preheat in, 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 in a, in a uh, uh, or pre-cool buildings, actually, sorry, here, uh, in a, an intelligent manner while, um, while ensuring that dead bank constraints are never violated. Uh, we also have a, a setting, and I'll, I'll just, I, I have links about these papers at, at the beginning. I'll, I'll, I'll bring them up one more time. Um, but another setting, we've, we're, we're testing this on uh, inverter control. So we have a version of the IEEE 37 bus system with additional solar, uh, P, uh, solar PV systems, and the goal is to um, control the inverters at these solar PVs, uh, at, at, at these PV nodes. Sorry, it's <laughs> photovoltaic nodes, PV in that sense. Uh, uh, could basically control the inverters at these solar solar equipped nodes to minimize the solar curtailment that you want to uh, have, uh, subject to essentially voltage constraints given by a, a linearized approximation to the system. As well as you can all, of course, you know, you can't curtail more than you actually have. Um, and so when we do this, we again see that uh, here we're actually just trying to kind of match that we're, we're, we're trying to show that this, this controller can not exceed the performance of a, of a linear control law, but with, um, with these constraints, with no sort of knowledge of optimal control, just you know, a, an RL method sort of learning to, to optimize online, uh, we're trying to see how well that thing can do. And what we find is that you know, pretty quickly it sort of operates online. So the first day is actually quite, here is quite bad, but basically by the second day of operation, just from seeing how the system reacts, we've been able to um, uh, essentially match the performance of a linearized of an optimal linearized control law. So basically, MP an MPC-based linear control law um, with really no notion of sort of the solving the problem, just using a neural network to do this um, while never exceeding maximum voltage constraints. So unlike kind of traditional volt bar control, we 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 or the sort of standards for volt bar control, we we don't ever exceed the maximum voltage because we have that built in as a hard constraint into our into our control law. Okay, so so uh, I went through those quickly. I know I'm happy to talk maybe more about them in, in, in the in the panel or later or questions now. But the basic point I want to emphasize is the following: we can really incorporate robust control constraints, um, and in some sense, the same safety constraints of existing control methods into what I'll call kind of generic deep reinforcement learning. Um, so by incorporating kind of this combination of nominal controllers plus projection operators and differentiating to the whole thing, we're absolutely we're actually able to enforce the same kind of hard constraints of um, of traditional kind of robust control in the nonlinear control laws that we typically have in um, in the, that we typically want in deep reinforcement learning. Um, but of course, you know, a, a huge amount of work needs to be still done here. Uh, I think obviously on the application side, these are all just sort of, you know, very, very small simulated comparisons so far. Um, it really remains to be seen how these things will, will apply and scale to, to realistic large scale systems. But then maybe even more broadly, I'm, I'm really interested in how, in whether there are other middle grounds in some sense between robust control and RL. And are there other ways in which we can maybe incorporate more domain knowledge, like has been talked about in previous talks here, into the problem of combining robust control and, and reinforcement learning. So, so thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions now and also in the panel later. Thank you. <coughs> um, okay, so so uh, we probably have time for a couple of questions, Zico, yeah. and then I would suggest we take a, a bit of a break. Uh, before we start the panel, and um, if some of these questions don't get answered, maybe we can address them also at the panel. Sure. So I, I, I'm happy to sort of officially start the break right now, and I'll just talk into the break. Are we, are we starting the, are we starting the, the, the panel at 3.30? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we can push it back uh, maybe to 3.35 because, uh, okay. yeah, so we have about 12 minutes break. Okay, perfect. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer a few of them. I'm actually going to take a quick, a quick break before it comes. So maybe I'll talk till 3.30 and then, uh, and, then, and then go from there. Sounds good. Okay, so um, so so uh, yeah, let's get to it. So 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 Maria asks, um, do I differentiate between dynamic continuous control and optimization for scheduling of set points during on off? Yeah, so um, in I mean, <laughs> I know I use these terms th th these terms very loosely. I should be more specific here. So so in the in the last example, yes, I'm using a sort of a a. Um, like an optimal receiving horizon type control loss that's solved by optimization. So when, when I say sort of, you know, dynamic kind of control, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to sense of the optimal control law, or at least the approximate optimal one done in the receiving horizon control fashion. But, uh, but I, in, in, in general, um, dynamic kind of control does not mean optimization, right? It just means some, you know, given your current state, you, you specify some, um, you, 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 given your current state and other exogenous information, you just specify the, the control action you take. Um, I'm not sure if that, that, that is not that is not what you are solving in your inverter control. You are really just scheduling. You are doing optimization. In in the inverter control, yes, With, that okay. one is just okay. scheduling power curtailment. Okay. Yes. That's so 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 yeah, I, I should be more specific. That 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 really is in, in, inverter scheduling. It's just right. solving power curtailment in, in, in a reasonably high frequency fashion. So it's on the I think it's every five minutes or every one minute, but it's on that order. It's not frequency control though. It's 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 power it's power scheduling. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I should maybe call it scheduling or something like that instead of control there. Um, uh, for robust worst case for defining for a specific scenario, uh, what was the second question you had there? I didn't quite follow that one. Maria. Uh, sorry, I I was just throwing questions for the future, but uh, yeah. So what, what you're solving is robust control and that's, fundamentally conservative, right? Yes, absolutely. Can we think something about using reinforcement learning to, to decide on the fly what is the relevant scenario? I see. I don't, right. I don't know if I'm asking this question well, but I think- No, I understand. I yeah, so like, like actually learning which uncertainty set in some sense is the right one to be considering, right? So robust control right. is all about, so, Right. Okay. So, so, so let, me, let me sort of mention that because I, th I think that point that point bears um, bears some further uh, further discussion. So, robust control is of course overly conservative. It is planning for the worst case. Therefore, it's going to be suboptimal in the average case. Um, and we are trying to make it less suboptimal, but we're not making it fully less suboptimal. And the reason why is that we are still ultimately bound by the Lyapunov function that is accounting for the worst case under the specification. So we're trying to find a nonlinear control law that allows us to have more representational power, but it's still one that satisfies the Lyapunov function of that control specification with a linear, you know, arrived through via a linear policy. So it's, it's going to still be very conservative. Zico, um, let me yeah. try to clarify this for power systems. I think it's an important concept. Okay. People are moving now from what they call preventive scheduling to corrective or flexible scheduling, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So preventive is all what we are thinking about in yes. worst case, right? Well, yeah. And, and so I think that's the distinction that I am asking about in machine learning. Right. So, so okay. Um, There is an aspect of this already built in here. So, 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 so yes, it is preventive in the case that like you, you, you are assuming certain a priori bounds, but then you can be more reactive in real time than you would be with a linear control law. So that, that, that's sort of the first thing I'll say. But, but I think the bigger question I'm, I'm not answering yet, which is the bigger question is sort of, can you more accurately um, refine your uncertainty right. Right. on the fly based upon observed data? Uh, and the answer is almost certainly yes, uh, but this is not what this thing here deals with, right? So, so we're not talking about that here at least. Um, what we're talking about here is much more just about, you know, given an specification, how well can you solve that? Um, I think so, yes. I mean, I think that a lot of RL, a lot of machine learning is concerned with sort of finding, um, in an online fashion, finding the, uh, the best, um, 
yeah, finding the best sort of reflection of reality that best matches the data we see, right? This is sort of what machine learning is all about. And so of course we could also, yes, try to refine the specification and say, okay, I think I'm in one of these scenarios because they are the most consistent with all my data so far and have some sort of learning process to, to estimate that or estimate like parameters of which one, which scenario you think you're in, et cetera. Um, so it's definitely possible. That being said, um, the, the, the goal here was to show that for a given uncertainty specification, you could still meet those constraints. And I think it's, it's somewhat orthogonal to the question, right, of trying to determine what those constraints should be. Thank you. Um, so someone was asking for a little bit more information about the, the curtailment use case. Yeah, so, so uh, hopefully maybe the question I, I mentioned to Maria uh, uh, clarifies a little bit. So essentially what we're doing is we're doing, um, and I forget the exact results, I think it's five minutes scheduling here, five minutes scheduling of curtailment of solar loads. Um, so it's very, fairly low frequency, though it might be higher. I have to actually check that. <laughs> I have to honestly go back and, 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 and read that to, to, to make sure. Um, the, the much more details are in the paper, which is on archive, actually, if you want to take a look. Um, I'd probably just do the same, actually, and, 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 and remind myself what, 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 what the actual details there were. So this is the, this is the second paper here, and it's appearing this year at ACM eEnergy. Um, essentially, it was what, what, what we were doing, and, and, and so it was being trained online. So essentially, what we were doing is we were looking to, uh, in an online fashion, um, uh, you know, given these sort of five minute or however frequent samples we have, um, try to use as a cost function the, the degree of, of curtailment, so basically trying to minimize curtailment um, while respecting the constraints that we have from the linearized uh, dynamics of the system with certain bounds to, to sort of respect the, the fact that this is nonlinear in practice. Um, and, and it was done in an online fashion just to sort of you know, continually try to adapt to the, the, the stream of several days that we saw. So it's, it's all online operation and then we are adjusting the policy in real time. Uh, or I mean, in, not, not in real time, but we're adjusting the policy in an online fashion over the course of those days, just to minimize curtailment. And over the course of about a day of sort of seeing how how, how the system reacts to our to, to our actions, we're able to sort of match the performance of the optimal of, of, of the optimal policy under those same constraints. So that's that's sort of the, the setting there. But again, the more details will be will be in the in the paper there. Thank you very much, Alejandro. I think maybe this is where we stop. Yeah, let's maybe stop now and come back in five minutes for the uh, yeah. for the break. Right. Thank yep. you. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Zico. Thank you so much.